So, um, first of all, uh, two or three words on me. Um, I'm English uh, by birth and education. And I was at Cambridge and Oxford before I came here to Limerick uh, some 30 years ago to start lecturing. So I've been here a long time. I'm very interested in the commercialization of research as well, which is, tends to be where my focus has been. Over the last six years, I've been semi-wheelchair uh, bound, which is why I'm sat here talking to you rather than standing up, waving my arms around, which has become something of the fashion for uh, TED Talkers. Uh, I'm going to talk about climate change today, and I'm going to talk about climate change from an engineer's uh, perspective. I'm an engineer. And I'm particularly going to uh, talk about um, two groups of people, and one group of people we will call the deniers, and the other group of people we'll call the greens. Uh, so I will come back to talk with them more later. So I'm going to talk only about CO2. It's a major greenhouse gas. And I'm going to talk about electrical generation, which generates an awful lot of CO2 as well. So now we're at about 415 parts per million of CO2, uh, which may mean something to you, but doesn't mean very much to me. What means something to me is that this amount, whatever it is, it keeps going up for the last 50 years or so. So year on year, it keeps growing. So, of course, we have a natural uh, climate cycle, if you like, that the planet Earth goes through. So this cycle happens hundreds of thousands of years. Every hundreds of thousands of years goes up and down, up and down. So what we have is something that's going on perhaps at most in, over the last hundred years. It is a natural uh, cycle. So the oceans and the atmosphere are great stores of CO2, carbon dioxide. And this is a, a kind of interchange between these two great reservoirs of CO2. The overall amount of CO2 between those two reservoirs stays more or less the same. What we have got is the so-called anthropogenic, i.e. the pit which has been produced by you and I. And it's much smaller than the oceans or the atmosphere, but it just keeps growing. So that is the problem we as humans, we need to address. Now, I'm not going to talk about anything which will disturb uh, the world economy. And the reason for this is I think that human beings respond very badly to quick changes. So we don't want to change anything fundamentally at all, but we want to solve this problem of climate change. Now, the biggest problem that we have around climate change, well, the central problem is that we release CO2 into the atmosphere. If we didn't release it into the atmosphere, we could do something with it. But once it's released into the atmosphere, it's very, very difficult to do anything with it. So we might compare this with nuclear power. So in nuclear power, all of the waste from nuclear reaction is confined. So we know where it is, and we know what we want to do with it. So you may ask, uh, why aren't you proposing nuclear power, then? The problem with nuclear power is that it's too expensive. And it's too expensive because it takes so long to build a nuclear reactor. About 70% of the money that you have to borrow to build the reactor actually goes in servicing the debt, i.e. it's the interest payments that you have to pay. So we can look at it and say, well, we have to solve that problem of nuclear power to start off with. And I think it's fair to say it's going to take at least 30 years to solve that problem, how to build cheap reactors. So what are we going to do for the next 30 years? So that is a central part of the talk. So what I'm going to propose is that we uh, look at the atom cycle. And so you're probably all sat there saying, what on earth is the atom cycle? 
Well, I, it's a, in a lot of ways, it looks like a regular power station that we have lots of. It generates electricity, and it uses fossil fuels. It uses oil, gas, or um, coal. But the smart thing about the alum cycle is that it releases no atmospheric CO2. None at all. And we could say that if CO2 uh, had colour and smell, we'd have probably addressed it uh, as a problem earlier. But it's odourless and colourless. And I think that's one of the reasons why we tend to ignore it. Now, the thing which is novel about the uh, alum cycle is that it uses a thing called supercritical CO2. So we're all used to fluids being either a gas or a liquid. And a supercritical fluid is neither a gas nor a liquid. And it's been known about for a very long time in some ways, since about the 1830s it was discovered. And it's been known that it's a way of um, driving a thermodynamic cycle, which eventually generates electricity. It's been known that it can do that really, really efficiently. And that's been known about since the 1960s. So you may ask, well, if it's that good, why haven't we done anything? Well, there's one very simple answer to that, because it takes very special materials to, be, to get it to work. And those materials have not been available uh, to, to engineers until these last 20, 30 years or so. Now, it's also a very important point to make here that it, it works. This isn't a fanciful idea of somebody that says, well, that's a good idea. We could, should try that, really. They have tried it, and it does work. They built a plant, uh, a significant size plant, in Texas, and it works. And we may also look at some other features of the Allen cycle, which are really good as well. So it's about one twentieth of the size of a normal power station. And that means it's probably cheap to build, and we should be able to build them fast. The next thing to note is that it's very efficient. That is, in the transfer of the calorific value of the fuel, the hydrocarbon fuel, it's extremely good at transferring that into electricity. Now, I've called it throughout this so far the alum cycle, which tends to get called. And I'll give you its full name. It is an oxyfuel, semi enclosed, recuperated, transcritical, high pressure, low pressure ratio, CO2 cycle. And I think that really tells you why I call it the Allen cycle. Now, we've been interested in the whole issue, us human beings, the whole issue of carbon capture and storage. And I say by carbon, we mean CO2. So carbon capture and storage has been a focus of much research for a long time. And it may be the case that now with the Allen cycle, we have reduced that problem to carbon storage, because to capture half the problem is perhaps solved. I'll talk about what we mean about storage in a minute. But it's worth saying about how the Allen cycle actually started. And some 10 years ago, it was a venture capital company in the United States looking at something, trying to find something that they could invest in. And they looked and looked and didn't find nothing. So eventually, they turned to Rodney Allen, as on the Allen cycle, who was then retired. And they asked him, could, they, could he invent something uh, to solve their problem? And he went away, and six months later, he came back with the Allen cycle. Done. Net Power was formed. That's the company uh, formed to exploit it. And the reason I got to hear about it is an old college friend of mine, a chap I shared a flat with as a student, uh, I got in touch with him again, and he's working for NetPower. So he told me about it, and I became more and more 
interested. So now back to the problem of CO2 and how do we store it? So the first thing that may come to mind is say, well, do we need to, human beings need CO2? Do they need it for doing something? And the answer to that is yes, they do. We have lots of industrial uses for CO2, but not that much. The amount that we produce in power stations throughout the whole world, and there are hundreds and thousands of them, is vast, absolutely huge. And the amount that we need industrially is fairly small in comparison. So industrially might answer the problem in the early days of the LM cycle, but it isn't the long-term solution. We have to find something that will hold these vast volumes of CO2. Now, this has been a question that's been asked for the last uh, 10 or 15 years, and there is, as far as anybody knows, only one place that we can put it safely away, and that is in saline aquifers, salt aquifers. And what that means is it's just a large reservoir naturally occurring either under the land or under the sea. And the EU looked at the EU uh, land mass and said that the EU has 150 years of storage under the, law, under the land. And the US did the same thing, and they came up with an answer they have 900 years of storage. Now, this brings me back to the question I originally asked about the Greens. Because the Greens, as we know in Ireland, have the power to stop anything dead if they don't really like it very much. And they might not like the idea of storing CO2 underground. Not that they could put their finger on anything would be wrong with that, but just because it's not a natural thing to do. So the Greens could be the biggest problem in this proposal. Now, it's always handy when you're um, looking at these sort of problems uh, to think about what's going on locally. So, at the moment, you in the audience are sat about 100 yards away from the River Shannon. And if you caught a boat out there on the River Shannon, Arles' longest river, and travelled 100 kilometres down towards the Atlantic Ocean, then eventually you would pass Money Point and Tarbot power stations. Now, Money Point and Tarbot, one on one side of the estuary, the other on the other side, is the biggest concentration of CO2 anywhere in Ireland. Okay, so although it's a very green field sort of site, it is the biggest um, concentration of CO2. And it has a high concentration because one of them burns oil and the other one burns coal. And the Irish government could have uh, partially solved this problem many years ago by just turning to a gas-fired power station, which uses or produces about half as much CO2. And basically, they did nothing. Now, the next question is, is there anywhere to store the resulting CO2? And the answer is, well, maybe because there's a saline aquifer called the Clare Basin, which the Money Point power station is built on top of, which is pretty handy. Now, the Clare Basin has been looked at by the Irish government as a possibility, and they concluded, no, they couldn't do it. But they only looked at land part of the Clare aquifer, and about nine-tenths of it is out in the Atlantic. And they looked at it some 10 years ago when technology has changed enormously since then. So there is a possibility that we could store the CO2 from the Money Point and Tarbot power stations in the Clare Basin. Now, the company Net Power, which I've mentioned before, has great ambitions uh, for the AM cycle. So they plan to build, plan is probably the wrong word, they think about building thousands of them, which is what it will take to begin to put a dent in the carbon 
uh, crisis. And it's important to note that they haven't solved all the problems. We only know uh, what they solved by what they published, and they published quite a lot. But there's lots more to do. And it's important to say that they only got the thing working about six months ago, so this is very, very early days for it. I'd like to finish with making a plea to my generation. Because there seems to be a, a split between the views of different generations here. The younger generation seem to be uh, very keen on this because they have to live with it. My generation don't seem so keen to do it. And my generation tends to be the generation of policy makers. We tend to be the people with power. So I make a plea to my generation to help the next generation by assisting them, by solving this problem. Thank you all very much.